How many of you look forward to and just have pure joy enter your ventricular chambers when you think about leg day? Well, if that's you, you are in luck because today we're going to talk about one of the most important muscle groups that should be exercised during leg day. And that muscle group includes the hamstrings. These are incredibly important muscles for the strength and functionality of your lower limbs and obviously play a huge role in sports and athletic performance. But unfortunately, they are a very commonly injured group of muscles. So today, we're going to show you real human hamstrings so that you can understand the anatomy of these muscles and then apply that information to our discussion about some of the most effective exercises for strengthening and bulletproofing the hamstrings. It's going to be a stringy one. So let's do this. So in order for us to understand some of the best workouts or exercises for the hamstrings, it would probably be a good idea for us to go over the anatomy and the function of the hamstrings. The hamstrings are located on the back or the posterior aspect of the thigh and are actually made up of three individual muscles. We have the biceps femoris, the semitendinosus, and the semimembranosus. And let me show you some really cool, unique features of each one of these muscles, which will help us to understand why they were given their names. The biceps femoris was named because bi means two and seps means heads, and we're gonna see that we have two heads here. And it's covering the backside of the femur. Here you can see the long head crossing all the way from the hip down to cross the knee and attach at the head of the fibula that you can see here on the cadaver, as well as over here on Jeffrey the skeleton. And if you were to like bend your knee, it's that tendon that you could feel on the outside of your leg, just right above your knee. And here we have the actual short head of the biceps, and you can see a little piece of it on this side as well. But notice that the short head only crosses the knee. It does not cross the hip, and we'll wanna keep that in mind when we talk about effective exercise choices a little bit later on. Next, we have the semitendinosus, and this is one of my favorite hamstring muscles, because as you can see, based on the name, it has this really long cylindrical tendon. And as a really cool FYI, they'll use this tendon sometimes as a graft to replace a torn ACL. Maybe you've heard of people say, they took a piece of my hamstring to replace my ACL, and this is what they're referring to. But unlike the tendon of the biceps femoris, the tendon of the semitendinosus actually wraps around the inside or the medial aspect of the knee coming around like so, and it attaches to the medial aspect of the tibia. And this relationship of how it wraps around the knee will be important for some of our exercise choices, again, that we'll talk about a little bit later. But last, we need to cover the semimembranosus. And taking a look at the proximal portion of this muscle, you can see this broad membranous tendon that gave it its name. This muscle also inserts onto the tibia, but just onto the backside of the medial condyle of the tibia. It doesn't wrap completely around like the semitendinosus did. Now, one other thing that I wanna point out is that all three of these muscles converge and share a common origin or attachment of origin on the pelvis, specifically on this bony landmark right here called the ischial tuberosity. And the ischial tuberosity is often referred to as your sit bone, it's pretty much what someone can feel when you're sitting on their lap and they accuse you of having a bony butt. But the reason I showed you the different areas on the skeleton where the hamstrings are attaching is that I wanted to make sure to emphasize that the hamstrings, all three of these muscles, are considered biarticular muscles, meaning they cross and mobilize two joints, which as we've seen, this includes the hip joint and the knee joint. So at the hip, the hamstrings perform hip extension. And hip extension can look a little different based on whether or not the lower limb or the foot is fixed to the ground. When fixed to the ground, hip extension looks like this, similar to how you'd perform an RDL. When not fixed to the ground, it looks more like this. This is technically hip flexion, but as I pull back, that's hip extension. And if I go through anatomical position, that's technically hip hyperextension. At the knee, the hamstrings perform knee flexion, which looks like this. Now you can lock the foot in place with knee flexion and pull the body upwards, but you have to get a little more creative with locking the feet in place. And we'll give some specific examples of how you could perform that when we get into some of the more effective hamstring exercises that I keep teasing you about. Now when it comes to picking the best exercises for the hamstrings, the reality is that any of the exercise that we talk about today 
will improve the overall strength of your hamstrings. So you could pick just one to focus on and you would get improvements in strength. But ideally, it would be the most beneficial to choose an exercise that focuses on the hip as well as a movement that focuses on the knee. And starting with the hip, one of the best, if not the best exercises for strengthening hamstring hip extension is the Romanian deadlift. Now, the traditional deadlift is also a great choice for the hamstrings, but you do get more knee extension and therefore more quad involvement with the traditional deadlift. But with the RDL, you can more fully isolate the hamstrings and take the muscles through a greater range of motion by taking advantage of that eccentric lengthening during the lowering phase. Meaning, when you lower the weight down, you go as far as you can until you feel a moderate stretch, while of course maintaining proper spinal alignment. And one of the great things about focusing on this lowering and lengthening phase is that you train the muscle to be strong in a lengthened position, which can help reduce your risk of injury, such as pulling or straining the hamstring during sports or other athletic events. And if you consistently do this, you will likely notice that not only will you improve your strength, but you will also likely improve your flexibility, which makes it such a beneficial exercise. And of course, because of the nature of this exercise, you will also strengthen the glutes, back extensors, scapular stabilizers, and even the posterior delts. Now, with all this talk about working out our hamstrings, it's also important to do what we can to help our hamstrings recover after an intense workout. And part of that recovery process is putting amazingly healthy and good tasting food into the fundus of our stomachs. But one of the challenges of eating healthy is that sometimes meal planning and shopping can be quite the hassle. And that's why I'm excited to introduce you to the sponsor of today's video, Hungry Root. Hungry Root is an all-in-one recipe and grocery service that sends you fresh, high-quality groceries with simple and delicious recipes. And this can seriously lighten your load when it comes to meal prep. When my box first arrived, I was definitely impressed with the fresh, high-quality ingredients and everything was tailored to my preferences. But how did Hungry Root know all of my hopes, desires, and dreams when it came to my food choices? Well, I took a food quiz, and you can too, where you get to tell them about your favorite types of foods, snacks, and everything else that you enjoy delivering to your digestive tract. And did I mention the recipes are simple and super easy to follow with four ingredients that you can have put together and on the table in about 20 minutes. I used to spend way too much time deciding what to cook or relying on takeout, but now I'm actually enjoying more healthy home cooked meals with less stress. So if you're interested in trying out Hungry Root, check out the link in the description or scan the QR code. Plus the first 100 people to use my code, IOHA Root, will get 40% off their first grocery order with Hungry Root. And now let's get back to the hamstrings. Now, as I implied earlier, you could technically just focus on something like deadlifts and develop tremendous hamstring strength. So why add an additional exercise that focuses on the knee? Well, when you add a knee flexion based exercise, you tend to fire more into specific portions of the hamstrings and you activate two other really cool knee flexors that are not part of the hamstring group. And this can really help to provide strength and stability around the knee. First, the short head of the biceps femoris only crosses the knee joint. So this can really help to have a greater emphasis on this head. And the semitendinosus that you can see right here tends to be more active during knee flexion due to its architecture and its relationship that it forms with two other muscles I hinted to earlier that again are not part of the hamstrings. So let me show you how cool this is on the cadaver dissection. If you look at the inside or the medial aspect of the tibia just below the knee, you can see three tendons inserting into this common location. One of these is the semitendinosus, but the other two it include the gracilis from the medial compartment of the thigh and the sartorius, which is from the anterior compartment of the thigh. This side of attachment is for these three muscles is called the pes anserinus, which translates to the goose's foot because that's what the early anatomists thought this looked like was a goose's foot. But these muscles create an anatomical pulley, or in other words, because they wrap around the medial aspect of the knee, almost like a rope wrapping around a pulley, this gives them more leverage and a greater ability to generate force during knee flexion. So not only can you improve the strength of these muscles, but by doing so, you can also provide additional support and stability at the knee. So on to the knee flexion exercises. There are three exercises that I think are all good choices depending on your goals and current strength levels. We've got the good old fashioned hamstring curls, 
glute ham raises, and the Nordic hamstring curl. The glute ham raise and the Nordic really emphasizes the eccentric phase of the contraction as you don't want to fall forward too quickly. So this naturally causes you to emphasize the lowering or that eccentric phase. You can emphasize the eccentric phase with hamstring curls, but you generally have to be more conscientious of doing that. The Nordic tends to be the most intense as most people can't just jump on a Nordic bench and perform this exercise without some level of assistance, which you can do with shortening the range of motion or by using assistance bands. The glute ham raise falls in between as far as intensity is concerned, with the traditional hamstring curl being very easy for someone with less hamstring strength to start with because you can easily just adjust the weight to your current strength level, but can obviously make it more intense by increasing the weight as you get stronger. Now, is one better than the other? Well, that depends. Like I said, the traditional hamstring curl is a great starting point and could help someone build up to a glute ham raise and even a Nordic. And one thing that you could argue that makes the glute ham raise and the Nordics ultimately better exercises than the hamstring curl, and therefore exercises to consider working up to, is that they both engage more muscle groups. I mean, it's literally in the name, glute ham raise, but both the glute ham raise and the Nordics require isometric contraction of the glutes to assist in keeping your hips extended, as well as isometric contraction of back stabilizers and other core muscles. So you could definitely consider these two better bang for buck exercises. Now, I guess a con of these two exercises is availability, as hamstring curl machines tend to be more available at gyms than glute ham raise benches, and even more so than Nordic benches. But you can actually get quite creative with doing Nordics without a bench. Like I have a Nord stick that hooks under my door, and I can put a little pad underneath my knees and do quite an effective session at my house. Now, as far as a training protocol with frequency sets and reps, Again, you can get quite creative with this depending on your goals, but I'll give you a baseline example that works well. If you trained legs twice a week, on the first leg day, you could focus on a higher intensity RDL as your primary posterior chain exercise with a higher load of something that you could only do four to six reps of and a total of three to four sets. And then afterwards, you could use a lighter hamstring curl or an assisted glute ham raise or a Nordic as more of an accessory exercise a less intense accessory exercise with something that's like eight to 10 reps and maybe three sets. And then on the second leg day, you could flip flop the focus with the knee flexion exercise like a Nordic or a glute ham raise being your primary higher intensity posterior chain exercise of four to six reps, so a higher load for that and something that you do three to four sets. And then a lighter RDL as your accessory exercise for that day of eight to 10 reps and maybe about three sets. And this plan is assuming you're also including work on the anterior musculature, like the quads during these two leg workout sessions. Now let's have a word on squatting. In a previous video, I mentioned that the hamstrings are active during squatting and that ruffled some feathers a little bit with many saying the hamstrings are not involved in the squat. Well, it's a little bit more nuanced than that. Remember this whole idea that the hamstrings extend the hip, but flex the knee. And so when you squat down, the hip actually goes into flexion, which would actually start to lengthen the hamstrings at the hip. But because the knee also flexes at the same time during a squat, this would start to shorten the hamstrings, or you could think of this as negating some of the length gained at the hamstring during when the hip actually flexes. So some said that because of this, the hamstrings are not active during a squat, which isn't fully true. The hamstring is active during the squat, as the length gained and therefore the eccentric load placed on the hamstring at the hip is greater than the length that is returned at the knee. Or in other words, for most people, the hip moves more than the knee does during a squat. So there still is a net overall lengthening and therefore eccentric load placed on the hamstrings when you lower down into a parallel or deep squat. It's just that the load is nowhere near the load placed on the hamstrings like with the other exercise that we've talked about today and the squat is still much more of a quad dominant exercise. So hopefully that gave you some new and useful information about the anatomy of your hamstrings, as well as how to incorporate different exercises into your routine. So thank you for watching our crazy anatomy videos. Let us know what you thought of the video in the comments. And of course, we'll see you soon.